Who am I and why should you listen to me? Um, I started out, as I said, getting a PhD in nuclear physics. Um, and I quickly realized that my uh, career trajectory was following along with a lot of my um, friends and that I was going to be transitioning from postdoc to postdoc to postdoc, fighting for grant money, never getting grant money, being sad all the time, <laughs> and generally just kind of following that path. Um, and so then I started doing some research around and saying, okay, um, what can I do with my degree that would be useful um, and not involve begging for money? Um, and so I found data science um, and I started sort of digging into what do I need to know and actually to actually get into this um, and to be an effective data scientist. Um, and so before I did all that, I worked on this behemoth of a machine, um, which is called the star detector. Um, for those of you that are going to give me like 10 seconds to geek out on physics, this is a place where we smash gold atoms together and recreate little mini Big Bangs and actually study the stuff that happens in the beginning of the Big Bang. So that's your physics message for today. Enjoy, chew on that. Um, and so what I'm going to try to convince you is that there is like a six month path to becoming a data scientist if you're willing to put in the time. And that six months is a little flexible. Um, some people will need more, some people will need less. But I'm going to kind of lay out the tools that I picked up along the way and why I chose those tools. Um, to focus on. So let's jump right in. Um, I'm going to get to the schedule at the end, but first I'm going to tell you about each individual piece that I tried to put together. But if there's only one thing that you remember from this talk, so you can ignore me after the next slide if you really feel like it, um, just build something with data. And with a big caveat, you're going to suck at it for a really long time. Um, so what I mean is that data science is a really hands-on sort of thing. Like, you're going to learn more in two hours of messing around with this tutorial you found online than if I stood up here for two hours and talked to you about some theory. But the theory is important. Um, understanding what's happening behind the scenes is really important. Um, but at the end of the day, what it comes down to is, can I start with some weird data that I found online, for instance, the IRIS data set, nice call out there, um, and then build out something that does something somewhat useful. So that could be classifying flowers if you're really into flowers. That could be uh, predicting box office from movies. Like these are all toy examples, but they're really useful examples because you can you're building something out with data. So, at risk of embarrassment, let me show you my very first data project from about eight to ten years ago. Uh, this is C++. None of you expected to see C++ today. You're welcome again. Um, and my goal was to work with a program called Jant4. If any of you know Jant4, my deepest sympathies. I. I'm glad that you're surviving and you're here and thriving. Um, what it involved was building out box after box after box of simulation material. So I needed a bunch of water and I needed to be separate waters to track things. And I knew nothing about code, but I found a tutorial online that said you can make a box by putting this thing. And I knew I needed 100 boxes. And these are the first 39 boxes. Um, I ran out of screen space or you would see the rest of them. Um, with some hindsight, this is what the code would look like. <laughs> this is called a for loop. Zach was very quickly introduced to for loops soon after this project. Um, but, and this is the key thing, if you look into my thesis, um, which I don't recommend you do, um, and you go through and you find the section on simulations, the thing that actually made that was this nightmare. Right? And that's a key thing that comes up over and over with data, data projects. Sometimes your code's not going to be pretty. You're always going to shoot for pretty code. That's always the goal. But a lot of the times, this nightmare works just as well if you're willing to put in the time. So yes, when you get, start digging into becoming a data scientist, shoot for great code. But at the end of the day, if you're working on a data project, the key is, does it work? So now I'm going to launch into a somewhat unfortunate truth about data science. Um, I'm going to let the next slide sort of speak for itself. Um, a lot of people don't want to get into the math underneath. And for me, when I was trying to make this transition, when I was trying to decide, hey, is data science something I can do, I found tutorial after tutorial after tutorial, and I figured out what, was, what worked, like how to copy and paste code, how to call certain things. Um, but I never really put together um, why they worked. And so I spent actually a lot of time later going back in and saying, OK, let's figure this out. And I think that's a really key thing to do as you're trying to approach data science. So let's take a couple minutes here and look at the top left. Um, this is called clustering. It's a type of unsupervised learning. 
Um, I'm not going to go to go into the details of it, but it's all based on calculating distances in this space, and you, that means that you have to understand calculating distance. That means you have to know what a Manhattan distance is, what a Euclidean distance is, what different spaces are. It also has an underlying assumption that you understand the top right plot, which is that vector spaces exist, that matrices exist, that feature spaces are a thing. All of that comes out of linear algebra. And so one of the things that you have to really dig into in order to like, truly understand what's happening underneath your algorithms and not just be a person that pastes algorithm after algorithm and see if you can make it work, is that linear algebra is key, and that means you're going to have to get into the linear algebra. On the bottom left, um, this is a wonderful plot that shows gradient descent. And for those of you that don't know what a gradient is, that's calculus. Basically, that's a bunch of derivative stuff. Right? And so all we're trying to do is there's some, some pinkish dots that are hanging out underneath here. Um, and you can follow those pinkish dots from the top of this curve and try to find the bottom. That's an optimization problem, and that's calculus. Which means that if we want to understand what's happening in gradient descent, we have to understand calculus. Finally, bottom right plot. Um, we have an area under the curve. This is a type of metric for determining whether your classification model is any good. Um, not going to go into the details again, but this is more calculus and some statistics. So whenever we're going to evaluate models, we're going to pick on metrics and try to figure out whether our model is any good, we have to understand a little bit of statistics and a little bit of calculus again. So, as far as the math of machine learning, when you get ready to try to make this, this jump, one of the things you're going to have to do is attack all four of these and try to come to terms with them. You don't necessarily have to be an expert, but you do have to have sort of an intuition and understand what's happening if you want to know what's happening underneath. And I have some great news. MIT does it for you. So, open courseware is a great thing that's kind of, kind of come out in the past 10 years. Um, and what that allows you to do is, if you're dedicated, you have no life, you're willing to spend your evenings and weekends watching math lectures, like me, um, you can dig right into this and start reminding yourself, like, hey, I know I saw this in college, but I'm pretty sure I was intoxicated. Let's try this again. Um, and so you start going back through this, and you can pick up the math information that you were missing, or that you forgot, or that you've never seen before. And these are all great video lecture series with uh, homework and stuff that you can pick up and really work through. So now I'm going to jump into probably the most divisive topic of this comment or of this talk. Please throw no punches. Python versus R. Um, so, people have very strong opinions about this. Um, these are kind of like the two leading machine learning languages right now. I'm waiting for another one to kind of come in and take their place, like, you got to be flexible. But I get people asking me all the time, which one should I choose, which one should I learn? Um, and the good news is, they're both pretty good. Just pick one, whichever one makes sense to you. So for me, I came from a C++ background. Python's more similar to C++ than R is. Python also allows you to play with microphones really easily. I like microphones, so I picked Python. The key is that you dig into the language that you choose and actually learn it as a language before you learn it as a machine learning tool. So the, like, the temptation is to jump right in and say, okay, I want to do machine learning. Come hell or high water, let's do machine learning with one of these. But that's not very useful because you don't actually learn the language like, in a deep way. So what I recommend is that before you jump into the machine learning, um, you take a month, two months, and really play with the language and learn it. Do interview questions. There's tons of them on the internet. There are tons of great resources. R has a package called Swirl that will let you dig into how R works. Python has uh, Learn Python the Hard Way. There's a ton of really cool resources for this. After you've done that, after you've kind of made sense of the language, um, that's what I recommend picking up sort of the one purchase you would have to make to follow my plan. Um, and most of this is open, open source, so you can pick it up online. This is where, this is probably the best $30 I ever spent. So I went out, I went to Barnes & Noble, which is a bookstore, it's not online. Um, and I started looking through data science books that I could pick up for less than $40. I found data science from scratch, and I worked through it top to bottom. So Joel Bruce, um, I, I owe him a beer if I ever meet him. Um, and then I also have gone through this book, and it's sort of the equivalent for R. It's very hands-on, it teaches you what's happening, it shows you how to use the language to really dig into things. It, a lot, both of these have great solved examples. They can really show you how to get into uh, machine learning. So after you've learned the language, then dive into the machine learning, and that's a place where a guide is really helpful. So 
what does a machine learning pipeline look like? Um, all of the data scientists in the room are going to be familiar with this. Um, but for me, this was actually a big leap. So I, I came from academia where our pipeline was give it to a postdoc, let him disappear for 16 days, and then he might come back with an answer and then yell at him, and then he can go away for 16 more days. But a machine learning pipeline is much more elegant, I think. Um, so the first key is to get your data. So when you're first learning, there are tons of great data sets out there. Um, the Iris data set comes up a lot, um, but there's a lot of places that have curated them. So in Python, that's my language of choice, so sklearn, which is a machine learning toolkit, has a ton of data sets just built in that you can play with. Um, otherwise, you're going to have to learn web scraping and APIs and stuff like that, but that's all advanced. You can pick that up later. Those are things that when you hit that point in a problem, you're like, crap, I have to go get data. You can learn that. Um, afterwards, you're going to clean your data. So this is the place where we spend 99% of our time, and it's also where we get really sad a lot. Um, you're going to try to remove NANDs. You're going to have to deal with infinities. You're going to find things that should be dates that are strings. You're going to find strings that, that aren't really strings. You're going to find all sorts of weird things. And so you're going to have to understand your data set. You're going to have to explore it and start making sense of it. And it's pretty normal to spend more time in this section than you do with your friends and loved ones. That's fine. It's just part of the deal when you start cleaning out data. Afterwards, you get to do some really cool things, which is start playing with algorithms. So once you have your data set, then you can start choosing algorithms, you can start tuning them, uh, you can start playing with uh, hyperparameters. All of those things are a great place to go find guides. So um, another person that I owe beer at some point is Machine Learning Mastery. I actually have no idea who that guy is that runs that site, but I have gone through pretty much every one of his little tutorials and learned a ton from it. So those are great. Um, and an underrated thing to do afterwards is visualize results. So it's tempting to get a result and walk away, but remember that visualization is super important. If you can't communicate your result, you may as well not have done it. This is also a place where Google and Stack Overflow are your friends. So anytime you hit a bug, anytime you hit something you don't understand, it's not a big deal. Just go ahead and find Google it, and then Google it some more, and then find a Stack Overflow that's not useful, and then find all the Stack Overflows that are linked to that one, and you can just kind of track things down. And then once you finish all this up, realize that whatever you did, you did wrong, and start over, and iterate on this multiple times. And eventually you start to refine your algorithms and your data cleaning and your data sets into something useful where you can actually start making really nice results. And so this is sort of the baseline of how, to get, of how machine learning problems sort of runs. As far as choosing an algorithm, this is another like, overwhelming step when you're first getting into things. Um, this is a very rough guide. I'm not by any means saying that this is um, the um, be all end all. There we go. Um, but you can use this as a guide to like, where do I start next? So maybe you want to do a regression. Maybe you don't know what a regression is. Who knows? So you start stepping through and you're like, I don't have 50, I have more than 50 samples. Great. I'm not predicting a, a quantity, but I do want to predict a category. So I'm going to follow this one and I can go into classification or clustering. And it lays out all of these algorithms that you can then say, hmm, I don't know what that is, but now I have something to Google. And you can start building out your knowledge by trying all these different things as you step through and start building up a knowledge for what you're doing. So, back to the timeline. The key to this is to attack things in sort of bite-sized chunks. Um, to try to jump right into this is really, really overwhelming. I know because I tried, and then I failed, and then I had to set out a plan. And so this was the plan that I actually wrote out for myself. Um, the first thing was to learn the math. Now for me, because of my background, this wasn't a two to three month prospect, this was like a one month refresher. But for most people, it will be two to three months. But the good news is, learning Python coming from C++, because I am not good at naturally at programming, took me two months. So where I had the beginning knowledge, I lost, or gained some time, I lost that time trying to understand Python. But again, this is a goal to shoot for, you're giving yourself little targets. And then you can build out machine learning tutorials and test projects, this is a place where you find something that somebody else has done and you say, I, I'm going to look at this for a little while, then I'm going to come back and try to build it up myself. And if you don't understand an algorithm, maybe take a shot at trying to program it yourself. Who knows? You might learn something along the way. And then finally, you want to get into these short-term passion projects. So don't go out and try to solve world hunger on project two. It's not a great place to start. But for me, I really liked baseball, so I attacked a baseball problem. Could I do classification for certain types of baseball stats? Excellent. That's a thing that took me about a month to figure out, to get it working. Um, 
And that's the type of project that you should attack next to build up your, your skill set. So now if you'll allow me a 15 second ad, um, what I do is I work for Metis, which is a data science machine learning and uh, like data science, machine learning classes, slash boot camps, slash whatever. Um, that six months is something you can do entirely by yourself, but it takes a lot of discipline, a lot of effort, and realistically, uh, no time at a bar or with friends ever. So um, what we do is we take um, students in, and we kind of build this up for them, um, with them, work together to, to get them to this level uh, in 12 weeks. So if you're interested in that, come talk to me afterwards. A few last notes, um, you're going to fail a lot. It's just going to happen. You're going to find bugs, you're going to find uh, algorithms that don't work the way you think, that's normal, um, and it's software, so no one really cares. Right? You, turn, you try to run your, your script, the worst thing that happens is it runs forever and you have to figure out a bash command to kill it. That's the worst possible scenario. So just go ahead and play with it. Um, point two, it's really sad the first time that you get a non-predictive model. So if you're following tutorials, right, you almost always get a really nice tutorial where at the end you had 90% accuracy. I can really nail down that that flower is blue. Like, I got it. But most of the time, not most of the time, but a lot of the time, you're going to find um, algorithms don't do as well as you hope. And that's normal. That's fine. If you get a null result, that's just as good as a non-null result if you're sure you did everything correctly. Because it can be just as interesting that these things aren't correlated or predictive as it is that they are predictive or correlated. Um, and then finally, um, I highly, highly recommend that you track your projects in GitHub and like keep an online presence of things you're doing because if you're trying to break into the data science space and you can go to an employer and say, ta-da, this is a thing I did, um, it actually looks really good. It's a point where you can say, hey, look, I'm doing this on my own and I'm getting results, I'm doing really cool things. So keeping an online presence and learning GitHub are really, like, are really strong um, tools in your toolkit. So thanks for letting me talk at you. Um, if you have any projects you're considering or you're working on something cool, let's ch like chat about it. This is sort of what I do. I like to talk about data, so uh, come find me afterwards. Thanks. Thank you, Zach. We have about seven minutes for questions. Okay, it looks like no one has questions. Going once, going twice. So you are coming from the background of science, right? And you learn um, data science only in six months. It's very impressive. So, how much you know obstacles you face during this process? Oh, a lot. Um, there was a lot of I won't say tears because it makes me look bad, but close to tears. Um, when you're trying to figure things out and you just have like a small bug and you don't really have the knowledge to figure it out, right? There's a lot of banging your head against a wall. Um, and then on top of that, um, coming from academia, a really major shift was industry. So um, for people who aren't familiar with like the way industry works, how job interviews work when you're not just like, hey, I know that guy in that university, I'll go work for him. Um, there's a, actually a really big shift. And so uh, the things that I found the most challenging were A, not having the knowledge to solve the problems I ran into, and B, trying to adjust to a whole different culture. Um, but there's like, a lot of challenges along the way. for you is like if you go to like an interview in a company like your background is you have a PhD in nuclear and then people will see your resume is very interesting <laughs> so they will ask uh, what kind of question do you, do you have during your interview for data science um, so I've been given a, a large range of questions but I think the most consistent one is why like how does physics prepare you for like a data science type position um, and really, the answer that I came back on is like I have done data analytics, um, but the key difference is that physicists do data analytics in a really dumb way in general. We have really, really complex equations we're trying to solve, and so we have to do the analytics in a very, very simple, reproducible way. Like we can't use latest technologies, and so trying to explain to them like, yes, I have done this, but I haven't done it in a like production environment, um, is one of those questions that came up over and over um, that you. Like I had to kind of try to overcome as I was transitioning between the fields. So Zach, uh, so you are, your background is physics, right? Correct. That's very, very mathematical. 
So you are fortunate, you, you have the background. Yeah. So but suppose for the people who are from liberal art, they hate math, and you need to work together with him in a, as a team, I mean, on machine learning. Mm -hmm. And you are the leader. Can you find something for him or her to do? And you guys work together happily. I mean, what I mean is, that guy doesn't need to be involved in a lot of the mathematical stuff. Um, yeah, so the, the reason that I jumped into the math so much was because I was interested in how the machine learning works. But if you can get somebody that um, can pick up a little bit of coding language, um, and you can kind of um, teach them just the basics of exploratory data analysis, they can become really valuable right away. Um, especially if you can teach them to make a few plots and understand like how to interpret a plot, which can be done pretty quickly. And so bringing in people from all sorts of like strengths, um, especially because I lack creativity in general, like that's just not my strong suit. Somebody that can creatively look at data and like understand like, hey, these things might be interesting to look at become really, really valuable right away. Um, and then we're learn like learning to like just give them the base knowledge to bring in algorithms and start working with the data um, is only a few weeks effort um, a lot of the time to get them up to speed to like a useful point. Um, and you can immediately start bringing value out of that collaboration. Thank you very much. <laughs> hey, oh, hey, we're working. Hey, thanks for the talk. Um, I also come from a physics background, but just kind of at the, uh, the BS level. Um, kind of looking to get into data science, but I'm also curious too, once you had that data science perspective, did you then kind of solve any physics problems in a different way? Yes, so uh, I'm really excited about this actually. Um, so when that giant behemoth of a machine that I showed earlier, um, when you, that's actually made up of millions and millions of detectors, like literally millions of inputs and outputs coming out all the time. So we're generating literally terabytes of data every second um, and recording it and things like that. And one of the things that you have to do to work with that is you have to simulate the response of the detector to understand like, hey, this particle hit here and I recorded this, what should have I recorded if it was actually true? And it turns out we're not very good at simulating things. And so right now I'm like working with neural networks to try to um, make classifications like, can I tell if this is simulated or real data? And then can I massage the simulation to look more and more like real data so I can get more and more accurate representations of things? And so right away, something that I couldn't have done because I have uh, you know, 60 inputs, I couldn't have looked at the patterns of those inputs and understood simulation data um, without more advanced techniques like neural networks. Um, I can now apply that because I, I'm not as limited um, in my techniques that I can use. And so bringing a data science perspective back to some of the hard sciences is a really cool um, like avenue to explore that I'm like, sort of really excited to get into. Hey, you mentioned the Mantis program. Uh, like, uh, I'm really curious, by any chance, can we get involved uh, remotely or online? So we are working on launching um, online coursework, um, and that is coming up uh, pretty soon. Um, and we're starting to do, like, we're getting set up for like live streaming courses as well. Um, so if you'd like to get more into that, we can talk afterwards about some of the opportunities. 